Our um, next um, graduating fellow is Michael Wattis from the University of Michigan. Um, Michael's um, research is in the fields of fluid dynamics and high energy density physics. His advisor is Eric Johnson, and he did his practicum at um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. That's a very strange lab. Lawrence Livermore. Good, they had a typo. <laughs> I was like, good. I was saying, I thought you only go to NNSA lab. So I'm glad you went to Livermore because that is the home of NIF. Um, today he's going to be talking about hydrodynamics of shocked interfaces. So thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, so the hydrodynamics of shocked interfaces is a really quite broad topic. So with the time that I have, I'm just going to do my best to describe just two areas of this research, uh, one of which is related to the work that I did during my practicum at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and the other which is highly relevant to uh, Richtmeier-Meshkoff instability mixing, which is uh, very important for a lot of different uh, high energy density flows. So in summary, um, you uh, get shock waves basically any time you have a significant amount of energy suddenly deposited in a small volume. And those shock waves propagate through space, and oftentimes they find themselves interacting with interfaces. And these interfacial, interfacial interactions are very important for a lot of HEDP, including dynamic compression experiments with lasers, which is what I'm going to talk about first. And so in these experiments, we utilize lasers to drive shock waves through materials such that we can study them under extreme pressure and temperature loading. And so what I did with my practicum is we looked at a technique for further increasing the strength of the shock wave, enabling us to probe even more extreme states on existing laser facilities. So then I'll switch gears and add a little bit of spatial dimensionality to the problem and talk about fluid mixing. So I'll talk about what happens when a shock wave passes through an interface. You get the richtmeier meshkoff instability. And specifically, I'll talk about um, the emergence of these high vorticity ejecta, which can significantly affect the flow's transition to a turbulent state. And so down here on the bottom of my title slide, just to keep things from looking uh, a little bit too blank, I have uh, uh, some fluid simulations of one such vortex ring actually emerging from a simulation of a shocked interface. So more on that later. Uh, so just to kind of start, I want to motivate all the different scenarios we have across uh, scientific and natural uh, applications that involve shock waves and interfaces. I've already described dynamic compression experiments with lasers and the Richtmeier-Meshkoff instability. Um, but this Richtmeier-Meshkoff instability, this fluid mixing, is really important for a lot of flows, including supernovae. So when a star blows up, basically it sends this shock wave propagating radially outward, and it passes through the layers of star, causing them to mix. And uh, that mixing has important ramifications for sort of the composition of any ensuing galaxy or nebula. Um, on like 20 orders of magnitude smaller length scales, we have uh, inertial confinement fusion, where now our shock waves are propagating radially inward, passing through interfaces, and compressing fusion fuel, hopefully to the point where we can get a sustained nuclear fusion reaction. Um, and then also there's a lot of scientists looking at ejecta physics, which is where you have sort of, a, um, you can picture like a metal surface with a groove on it, and you shock that and you look at the ejecta that pop out of these interfaces, and that's relevant. The ejecta themselves are an area of study, but you can also do things like scale up these experiments to asteroid collisions or, or planetary body collisions and really cool stuff like that. And before I move on, I just want to take the opportunity to highlight the fact that without even trying, I'm citing some research some, from some past SSGF fellows. The Richtmeier-Meshkoff instability experiments that I'm showing here are from Ben Moosey. And Allison Saunders is leading the charge sort of at Livermore, or, or is responsible for a lot of the really wonderful work that's been uh, coming out of Livermore related to ejective physics. So just goes to show you really don't have to look uh, very far to find excellent research conducted by SSGF and LRGF fellows and alumni. Um, so first I mentioned I want to start with uh, dynamic compression with lasers. And I'm going to use this sort of fictitious uh, material with all these different phase, phases that we think are there uh, and motivate sort of the, the need for dynamic compression to explore this phase space experimentally. So say we have this fictitious material and from either you know, theory or simulations we think that there's these five really cool states that we'd like to be able to probe experimentally. As I mentioned, one thing we can do is pass a shock wave through that sample. And so what that looks like is we use a high-powered laser to irradiate an ablator material. And as that ablator blows off the back surface of our target, we basically get a shock wave that propagates through our sample, compressing it, raising its temperature, and we can study it at these extreme conditions. Um, however, when we pass shock waves through samples, we're constrained to move along the material's shock hugonio, which is this path here that I'm showing in the, in the phase diagram. It's basically the lotus of points that can, be linked, uh, that can link sort of the upstream state to the downstream state across a single shock wave. And so if we want to explore phase B and phase C, that's great. You know, we can use a shock wave to get there. But in order to move to sort of higher pressures without raising the temperature so much, we have to do something else. 
So to do that, we can use a device called the diamond anvil cell. And it's uh, really uh, effectively just a, a diamond vise. You basically take your sample and you squeeze it in between two really, really hard materials, statically raising its pressure without really increasing its temperature so much. And then from this pre-compressed sample, we can then do the same thing as before, driving a shock wave through, uh, through our material. And we can see that we get to compress along now a pre-compressed hugonial, which will give us possibly access to this really cool phase D in our phase diagram. So the diamond anvil cell is an incredibly important tool for giving us latitude and exploring this phase space, but it's not without its limitations. So now your shock wave has to pass through a very thick layer, potentially very thick layer of diamond, where it can become sort of severely attenuated, and it might not be as strong as you want it by the time it reaches the sample to actually get it to an extreme state. Um, so for my practicum, basically, uh, if, we, if we sort of zoom into that, that sample and whatever material is immediately upstream of that, we would see that as the shock wave is propagating towards it, and it slams into the interface, compressing our sample. Uh, due to the impedance mismatch between the sample and whatever's immediately upstream of it, there's a reflected wave in the system. And that wave diverts energy that we might like to be coupled to actually compressing our sample to high pressures and temperatures. So we asked ourselves, is there something we can do at this interface, maybe try to like bridge the impedance jump just a little bit with some intermediate materials to possibly, for a small period of time, maybe just get a slightly stronger shockwave that can push us up into this phase E, where who knows what kind of physics are going to happen, right? But we can probe it experimentally. And so what this problem sort of simplifies to is a shock wave propagating in some left material of impedance IL. Eventually, it's going to propagate into the right material of impedance IR. But first, we're going to force it through an intermediate material of impedance I1. And you can solve this problem uh, using a method that I've actually developed as part of my thesis work, which effectively enables uh, solutions to uh, the Euler equations for arbitrary combinations of shock waves, interfaces, compression waves, and rarefaction waves. And that solution looks like this. So if you've ever studied compressible flows, you are familiar with XT diagrams. But if not, I'll just walk you through it just in case. So this is a space-time diagram basically showing the propagation of waves um, as they move through these different materials. And so just for example, let's try to use the laser pointer. All right, so if we consider the primary shock wave starting at the origin, it's propagating through the left material, breaks out into the intermediate material, and then breaks out into the rightmost material. And we can compare the solution to what we would get if we didn't have an intermediate step. And the system is much simpler. We just get a couple of waves. We get a transmitted wave into the right material and a reflected wave into the left material. And sort of the short version of the story is, with this intermediate material, you actually can drive a stronger shock wave into the rightmost material. Um, the catch, however, is that it only exists for a very transient period of time before these re-reflected waves that are kind of bouncing around in the intermediate step catch up with and overtake and weaken the leading shock front. Uh, but we can examine why we get that stronger state if, again, we examine these shock hugonios now in pressure particle velocity space. So uh, in the left material, we have the shock wave uh, compressing the left material to some new state L prime. And it's just a function of the strength of the shock wave compressing it to some point along its primary hugonio. And then if we want to figure out what the state behind uh, the shock wave in the, in the right material is, uh, we need to look at the intersection of the primary hugonio in the right material with the reflected hugonio in the left material. And the intersection of those two points gives us the state that we'll achieve, uh, state r prime naught, that is, has some pressure. Now if we include the intermediate step, we basically get another hugonio to work with. And now we can see that the state behind the shock in the right materials, it's still fixed by that primary hugonio in the right material, but now it's fixed by the reflected hugonio in the intermediate material, taking us to a state R prime, which has a higher pressure than R prime naught. So we get shock strengthening for a transient period of time. This is really cool. Then we can map out sort of this shock strengthening, this increase in pressure, as a function of sort of the overall impedance ratio of the left and the right material and the impedance of the intermediate material. And in fact, what we find is that between these two black lines and the yellow regions here, uh, corresponding to intermediate, impedance, uh, intermediate material impedances between the impedances of the outer two material, we get shock strengthening up to about 20% for some experimentally relevant um, materials. And so just to verify that this isn't all just you know, theoretical nonsense, we run some uh, verification simulations uh, with a hydro code. And so basically, the, the vertical slices in the figure on the left correspond to the lineouts on the right. Um, and the, the prediction uh, is the lineout using our method. And then the symbols represent different intermediate materials sort of sandwiched in between two outer materials. And we can see that we're able to predict both the magnitude and the trend of the shock strength that you can actually get from the inclusion of a single intermediate step. So this is very, very cool research. We can push the boundaries a little bit further and explore even more extreme physics. So now I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to add some dimensionality to the problem. And by that, I mean we're going to consider a shock wave now passing through a perturbation separating two different fluids of different densities. When that shock wave is passing through the interface, we get a misalignment of the pressure gradient, which points normal to the shock wave, and the density gradient, which is dominated by the interface. And so due to that misalignment, we get the deposition of baroclinic vorticity. 
So eventually, you know, the shock wave is going to get transmitted and there'll be a reflected wave. But the interface, after all those wave interactions are done, will effectively be left to evolve under the influence of the baroclinic vorticity deposited when the shock wave is passing through it. And so if we examine this perturbation a little bit later in time, we see that it grows. And eventually, it will get sort of this uh, alternating configuration of sort of bubbles of light fluid bubbling up into the heavy fluid, surrounded by spikes of this heavy fluid penetrating the light fluid. And this is sort of a pattern that a lot of people would recognize as the classical richtmeier meshkoff instability. And if we let this thing go even farther in time, we would see that the flow becomes increasingly complex. There is the introduction of new modes based on the interaction of existing modes. And we may actually develop a state where there's you know, a, a, a mode spectra that might be consistent with something like actual turbulence. But that's uh, still an open question, actually, uh, in the field, is whether or not a singly shocked interface can achieve a state of turbulence. But the flow, suffice it to say, the flow gets really, really complex um, at later times. And so since its sort of discovery in the 50s, a ton of research effort has been devoted to understanding the richtmeier meshkoff instability. And one of the primary quantities of interest is sort of the width of this mixing region between the two fluids as a function of time. The linear theory gives us the behavior early in time, you know, really down pat. We, we know what's going on early in time. A little bit later in time, we have some nonlinear models to describe mode coupling and, and things like that. And we can describe the, mix of that, uh, the width of that mixing region pretty well still. Uh, but then, as I've mentioned, the flow eventually becomes super complicated, maybe turbulent. And we, it's, it's very difficult to sort of understand what's going on in this flow. And in particular, sort of the handoff between like, the late nonlinear phase and the possibly turbulent phase is something that's of very, very significant interest to people developing the hydrocodes that the labs use. When do we turn on our turbulence models? No one really knows. A lot of people are working on this. Um, so uh, like I mentioned, it's actually unclear if a singly shocked, we, we don't even know if it can achieve a state of turbulence, so if we should even be turning on our turbulence models at all. Uh, so here I'm showing some uh, kinetic energy spectra for singly shocked in black and double shocked uh, um, interfaces undergoing the richtmeier meshkoff instability, um, all this being very inconclusive about whether a singly shocked interface gets to turbulence. And sort of a phenomena that we see emerging a lot in simulations and experiments that complicates this whole uh, mix of physics is the emergence of these, of these little high vorticity ejecta that it can escape the confines of the mixing region. And the reason they're important is because they're very, very hot sources of kinetic energy. Here I'm showing a log scale, and you can see all of these bright spots correspond to these little tadpole-shaped, I guess, ejecta that are fleeing the confines of the mixing region. And so whether or not this flow actually transitions to turbulence is going to be a strong function of the amount of turbulent kinetic energy available to the mixing region. And so if we have these ejecta flying off in every direction, transporting that kinetic energy away from the mixing region, that's certainly going to affect the transition of the flow. And we may, may be able to achieve sort of a state of turbulence, but, but maybe not. So understanding these ejecta in the context of the richtmeier meshkoff instability is very important. However, there are other flows where um, that ejecta is really sort of the dominant flow feature. And without describing everything that's going on here, I just have these little red arrows pointing to likely high vorticity um, ejecta popping out of all these different experiments, um, including the fill-2 perturbation and ICF implosions um, and ejecta physics as well, and, and also sort of like astrophysical jet uh, type research as well. So it turns out, however, that vortex rings have been something that have been studied in, in great detail in sort of a classical fluid mechanics context. And so I'll talk about that a little bit next. So by a classical vortex ring, what I mean is a vortex ring generated uh, in a water tank by submerging sort of a piston cylinder apparatus in that tank and ejecting a column of fluid of length L and diameter D uh, through the open end of that cylinder. And when we do that for relatively small stroke lengths, we get this tidy little neat vortex ring that's very stable and just propagates sort of merrily on its way down the, down the water tank. So if we pull the piston back farther and eject sort of a, a longer column of fluid, what we see is that the, the vortex ring grows. And this makes sense. So because we're ejecting a longer column of fluid, we're uh, giving the flow sort of more energy. And we should expect those properties of the vortex ring to also increase. However, what we see is at a critical point of around a stroke length of around 3.84, the properties of the vortex ring saturate. And we start to see the emergence of this trailing jet feature right here. And if we draw the piston back any farther, what we would find is that the vortex ring at the front of the charge ceases to grow, and all the additional energy circulation impulse are forced to accumulate in this trailing jet because they simply can't reach the ring that's pinched off. And so this suggests that there's really some sort of fundamental formation time or formation aspect ratio for vortex rings uh, that exists over a very, very wide range of applications. And it just so happens to be around a stroke length of four. So what's so important about four? I'm going to talk about that next. <laughs> 
we can arrive at sort of a quantitative prediction of what this formation number should be if we consider, if we make some sort of conservation arguments about the energy, the circulation, and the impulse in the flow. So for sort of a slug of fluid, you know, coming out of the open end of a cylinder, we can easily calculate those quantities. Then if we just take a model for our vortex ring in fluid mechanics, I take the standard model, the Norbury vortex ring, um, we, we can do the same, calculating the energy, the circulation, and the impulse um, of that vortex ring. We equate those quantities, and we can back out two equations for this stroke length as a function of all these non-dimensional parameters that are just functions of the non-dimensional mean core radius of the vortex ring. So we can then sort of look at these two curves and, and look at where they intersect, and it turns out they intersect at a single point. And what this point represents is the physical scenario where all of the circulation, energy, and impulse imparted to the flow by the vortex generator resides in the vortex ring that is actually formed. And it happens to be at around a stroke length of uh, L over D equals 3, which is not quite 4, but for some reasons that I'm not actually going to explain today, uh, the classical formation number is usually reported in this range of 3.0 to 4.6, and it's found to be incredibly universal across basically all applications of vortex rings. Um, so basically what I do is I look at vortex ring formation in, uh, from, from shocked interfaces, basically escaping the confines of the mixing region in, high energy, in uh, rickmeyer meshkov um, experiments. And so we can consider sort of an analogy, a shock wave propagating through a heavy fluid. It's going to pass into a light fluid, um, but it's going to pass through this interface along which there's this heavy fluid hole of diameter D in depth L. When that shock wave passes through, it's going to compress that hole a little bit, um, but the sign of the baroclinic vorticity deposited along the interface is going to cause that hole to start inverting its phase at some velocity. And as it's doing that, it's effectively jetting back up into the heavy fluid and training some of the light fluid along, along the way and resulting in a vortex ring that actually forms. And we can play sort of the exact same game in the classical case, calculating the energy, circulation, um, and impulse uh, of the vortex ring generator. Thank you. Vortex ring generator, which is now sort of this inverting hole. Uh, and the actual vortex ring that emerges. And what we see is that the formation number that we would predict for a vortex ring uh, generator from a shocked interface is related to the classical formation number by this parameter sigma here which is a function of nothing more uh, than the strength of the shock wave that's accelerating the interface and the density jump across the interface represented by an Atwood number here. So we can map out this, this multiplier, this sigma parameter, over basically all Atwood numbers and all shock strengths and generate this figure here that I'm showing on the left. And we see that we, have, we can expect an increased formation number um, for flows that generate vortex rings from shocked interfaces. And then these uh, symbols way over here on the left are, are what we're actually able to simulate with our hydrodynamics code um, in three dimensions. Um, and so these represent four sets of simulations uh, at what number and shock strength conditions for some verification simulations there. So I'm showing, showing two of those simulations here. On the left, we have a shock wave that is accelerating um, a hole along an interface uh, that relatively has a, has a small aspect ratio. And we see the shock wave passes through that interface. The interface inverts and ejects this, this single uh, vortex ring. Um, and it's really the main feature in the flow. It contains almost all of the vorticity of the flow. Then if we look at larger uh, whole aspect ratios, we still see this vortex ring, but critically, now we start to see the emergence of this trailing jet feature that has significant vorticity content, which is a sign, a, a signature, that the formation number has been reached for these flows. And so to really examine that, we need to look at the circulation in the ring as a function uh, of that uh, whole aspect ratio, which I'm showing here, for those four sets of Atwood number and shock strengths. And we indeed see a plateau um, at some point. And if we sort of drop a line to the horizontal axis, uh, we can see, we, we can basically figure out what the formation number is for those Atwood number and Mach number conditions. And then, so finally, what I'm showing over here is effectively a parity plot showing the prediction of the formation number using our, 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 um, our model here uh, in terms of uh, this parameter sigma and sort of that classically reported range compared to what we get, what we back out from our simulations. Um, and so basically, if, if our model is good, uh, all of these points should lie right on this line here in the center. And indeed, it looks like our model tracks uh, the augmented formation number, both the trend and the magnitude of it, very, very well, right near the center of what we would expect kind of from that classical range. Uh, so this is really cool. We think we effectively have generalized that fundamental piece of fluid mechanics literature to describe vortex rings that form from shock accelerated interfaces. Uh, so in summary, shock waves are very important in a wide range of high energy density physics flows, um, including um, uh, dynamic compression experiments with lasers, astrophysics, and inertial confinement fusion. 
Um, I talked about a method for strengthening shockwaves in dynamic compression experiments with lasers. Um, and then I talked about uh, sort of the rickmeyer meshkov instability and the emergence of these high vorticity ejecta that pop out of the mixing region. And now we can figure out exactly the time scales and, and sort of the, the perturbation sizes that we can expect to generate these, uh, these ejecta. And we can calculate things like their turbulent kinetic energy, their vorticity, um, all of that. Um, and, and that has important ramifications for the, uh, the development of the flow to a turbulent state. Um, so with that, I'll show my references um, and take any questions.